Hello, this is Mr. White, and this video is on the Law of Signs, the Ambiguous Case. And that title reminds me of an old Saturday Night Live sketch from the late 1990s, early 2000s. And I'm curious how many of you youngins recognize this picture from the sketch, but I should probably not say too much more about that. Uh, let's get into the lesson. If you don't already know the word ambiguous, it means um, open to several possible interpretations. It's unclear. And that's what we're going to be dealing with something today, something that's unclear and has several possibilities. But let's start with something that is not ambiguous. Let's refresh our memory from geometry class about those four congruence conditions or those four um, uh, uh, uniquely defining triangle conditions, SAS, SAA, ASA, and SSS. So I'll show you a quick example of the SAS case that you see here. And just to remind you how that works, we see that big A, the angle, is 34 degrees. And little b is five uh, units long. And it doesn't really matter whether I consider little b to be down here or whether I consider little b to be uh, this side over here. It doesn't really matter um, as long as it's not across from big A. Because remember, little a has to be across from big A. Little b has to be across from big B, et cetera. So as long as I don't violate that condition, um, then I'm good. So I'm going to leave little b up here. And I'm going to recognize that, therefore, little c has to be down here. I don't have any other choice. Again, it cannot come over here because then it's across from big A, and that can't be. Little a has to be across from big A. So let's uh, bring little c back here. And once I have satisfied those conditions, there's really no other way for me to complete this triangle other than to connect these two sides, or these two uh, uh, vertices. And again, um, since little a has to be here, big B has to be across from little b, big C has to be across from little c, and someday, in fact, in our next lesson, we'll determine how do we figure out what these values are. But we're going to save that for another today. Today, we're just going to explore what's going to be called the ambiguous case. And the ambiguous case comes up when you deal with SSA. Now, let me be clear. SSA is not always ambiguous. Your geometry teacher probably told you to stay away from it, not just because it made you snicker when you read it backwards, but because, uh, um, again, it was ambiguous. But sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's, it's not clear. Um, and rather than try to deal with these little toys here, I'm going to turn to my favorite toy, GeoGebra. And let's explore an SSA case in GeoGebra. All right, so here's an SSA case. And it, it's, it's an SSA case because here I have a side, S. Right next to it, I have another side, S. And then right next to that, I have an angle A. So SSA is what we've got here. And we see in this SSA case, there really isn't even a, a triangle being formed. That little a is too small to reach the ground. So I don't really have a triangle at all. Now, what if little a were bigger? So what if little a got somewhere around here? or bigger, I'm almost at the point where it's reaching the ground. I've almost got a triangle. And in fact, um, <clears throat> if I just get it, uh, if I'm wondering how long does it need to be in order to form a triangle, well, we could use our right triangle trig to figure out exactly how long it needs to be to reach the ground. Um, let me show that. If you look at the right triangle being formed there with the, with the pink leg, you could use your right triangle trig to determine that B times the sine of angle A. That gives you that minimum length needed for, uh, to reach the ground. Okay, and again, in our next lesson, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But for right now, let's just look conceptually. Um, in fact, I invite you on your calculator, bust out your calculator and calculate what B, again, 25 here times sine of 34 degrees or a calculate what that is on your calculator I'm not going to do it here, but you do that and it's probably something close to wh what little a is right now All right, so I'm just going to do it here in GeoGebra and Looks like I'm getting close getting close and I'm Gonna say is it going to get to 14? Oh, just short of 14. I have a triangle all of a sudden 
Okay, so now I have a single triangle. And if I make A even bigger, I enter the ambiguous te territory. So if I make A bigger, now I have two possibilities. I could either use this leg and form this triangle, the darker one here, or I could be using this leg here and I could be looking at this triangle. It's ambiguous. It's not clear from the given in information which one I should be looking at. That's why your geometry teacher told you to stay away from it. All right, but let's not stop there. What if I kept making A even bigger? It's getting bigger, getting bigger. Believe it or not, we're eventually going to enter unambiguous territory again, and here's why. If I make A big enough so that it's bigger than little b, bigger than that 25 um, length, we will see that it is no longer ambiguous. Now, you may be wondering, why did I gray out this leg over here? Well, the reason is because if we were to consider this leg over here, I'm no longer dealing with a 34 degree angle. Notice that big A would no longer be 34 degrees. It would be this obtuse supplement. It would be 180 degrees minus 34 degrees or, or 146 degrees. That's what the value of big A would be. That's why I don't consider this triangle over here because A was given to be 34 degrees. However, this side over here is still valid, so I would unambiguously have one triangle. All right, I'm going to make this uh, GeoGebra file available to you on the um, class website so you can play around with it as you wish. Um, but let's try to summarize this on paper. Again, I hope you, you really need to understand the logic behind this, but let's, let me show you what I would suggest you put in your notes. Um, leave yourself about half a page of notes for this. Oh, um, here's a textbook definition of the ambiguous case, if you find this helpful. Um, you can pause and read this. And likewise, in the current version of our textbook, um, on page 480, you see this exploration. And I've adapt um, I'm basically doing a, a, a variation of this. So if you'd like to look at this in the textbook, if you find that helpful, um, I welcome you to do that. But this is what I'm going to suggest you put in your notes. And again, don't, don't make this really tiny. Leave yourself about half a page for this. You want a table here with four cases. And um, I would title it something like the SSA ambiguous case. And, and we're going to look at big A being given as well as little a and little b. But consider that there may be other variations. We could be given big C and then little c and little a or something like that. So don't get too married to that one, um, the, the one case of big A, little a, little b. Okay, so again, on about half a page of paper, make this table, and let's fill in the first case. I want you to recall what you saw in the GeoGebra construction. Uh, remember how the first condition was that we saw that little a was too small to even reach the ground. And we established at that point that the ground was a distance of b sine big A. And so the comparison, the inequality that we want to write for this case is that if little a is less than that minimum length that it needs to be, which you said is B sine big A, then zero possible triangles exist. And let me remind you that um, all these quantities are given. Little a and little b and big A were given to you. So you can always make this comparison on a calculator. All right, case number two was where it was just long enough to reach the ground. So little a was just long enough to reach the ground, and that's what gave us a right triangle. And um, we just got the relationship that we've known for quite a while now as far as our right triangle trig goes. So that's where little a was exactly equal to little b sine big A. And we said that that's one possible triangle. And in, in fact, um, we can definitely say it's a right triangle. It's not even a possible triangle. It's one right triangle exists in that case, if little a equals exactly b sine big A. OK, the third case is what is called the ambiguous case. And, and perhaps I haven't been as clear as I could have been that not every SSA is, is called ambiguous. It's specifically this one. This is the one where we we drop that minimum length needed, and we say that little a can either swing to the right of it or it can swing to the left. And notice that if you're wondering, does this make a, an isosceles triangle? Yes, it will, and we will use that observation when we um, 
solve for these triangles in um, the next lesson or so. So that's where little a, and I'm gonna, um, also looking ahead to the next lesson, I'm gonna label these a1 and a2 just to set up for what we'll be doing later. That's where um, b sine a, big A, is less than a. Notice I'm trying to write my inequalities all in the same direction. I could have just as well written little a greater than b sine big A, but I just find it gets a little more confusing when I'm switching back and forth. I'm always writing less than on this chart. That's just a personal choice. Nothing wrong with doing it the other way. I think it just decreases confusion. Um, so anyway, that's when there were two possible triangles, but there's another condition I need to acknowledge up there. Um, we need to acknowledge that not only does little a need to be greater than this, this length, it needed to be less than this length. Because you remember what happened if little a got longer than little b? That's going to be our fourth case, so we'll cover that next. But I need to acknowledge now that little a also has to be less than just b itself. Barely got that in there. Okay, um, and again, make sure you note that this is the case that we call ambiguous. All right, so on to the, uh, um, and, and just uh, well, I, at the risk of being beating this to death, I just want to be absolutely clear. We are saying we could either consider that to be our triangle, and again, that's one we'll solve for in the next lesson, or this could be our triangle, and we'll also solve for that triangle in the next lesson. We'll solve for both of those two possible triangles. All right, fourth condition. Um, I had to draw this one a little bit bigger, or a little bit uh, different, make my... Um, clear up a little room on my drawing. This is where if little a was longer than little b, so I'm gonna intentionally draw it longer than little b. If I were to draw it like that, that would not look right because it's supposed to be longer than this side, little b. So I'm trying to draw these reasonable sketches where this just got longer than little b, and if I draw it to that side, this is a valid triangle. We can count that one. However, if I were to draw that same length to this side, I could not count this triangle because all of a sudden my, my big A is this angle, this obtuse angle. It's no longer the acute angle that I was presumably given. So when I draw it to that side, I'm not allowed to count it. So I'll just draw it over here and then cross it out. And I would suggest you write in your notes whatever you need to to make it clear why we're crossing that out. Say it's no longer a valid triangle or a big A would be obtuse or whatever makes sense to you to document what we've done. I want to remind you, that's really the purpose of this table is to, um, is I don't, maybe this will be sort of a, a training wheels when you just get started on the exercises, but ultimately we don't want to rely on this table. This is just documenting um, the logic that we've gone through to make these decisions. So this is the fourth condition. If little a is bigger than little b, or if you prefer little b less than little a, and we said we're back to an unambiguous case where there is one possible triangle. So again, let me remind you also that you should not become tied to big a, little a, and little b. I've seen on tests in the past where students have, have just memorized those formulas and they're using um, little b sine big a when in fact, the problem is giving big C, um, little c, little a. And in that case, the formula needs to change. So rather than memorizing formulas, remember all the, uh, the logic we've gone through. And in fact, for our example, let's go ahead and do an example in which I will use variables other than big A, little a, little b. Here's our example. State, this is exactly the wording you're going to see in the book and on the tests. Um, state whether the given measurements determine zero, one, or two triangles. And in this case, we're dealing with big B, little b, and little c. So here's how I would think through it. I would just tend to get in the habit of always saying, I'm going to draw my angle in this orientation. It obviously doesn't have to be that way, but that's how I choose to do it. And try to draw it reasonable, I would suggest. So I'd say this is a reasonable 49 degree angle. It's a little bigger than what we know 45 degrees to be. So call that 49 degrees, big B. And remember, little b has to be across from big B. So I'm going to now turn my attention to little c. And remember, little c, on the other hand, little c could be down here or it could be over here. You have a choice, but 
but I'm gonna recommend you just make it a, a habit to make little c be in this orientation. Make that little c. And then conceptualize that swinging pendulum of the GeoGebra graph. And ask yourself what that length is. And hopefully you're gonna say, okay, that's gonna be, oh, and let me note that c is equal to 10 units on the picture. And that distance there, using our right triangle trig, is going to be 10 sine of 49 degrees. So we turn to our calculator and figure out what the value of 10 times sine of 49 degrees is. And we see it's about 7.547. And so I'm going to put approximately equal to 10.5, 10, what am I doing? 7.547. And I would encourage you to note that on your paper. And then you very clearly see that if little b, which is across from big B, is, is a length of 8, it's bigger than this, but less than this. So little b is between those two values that are underlined in green. Therefore, it could either swing to this side or it could swing to this side, and we have the ambiguous case. And again, we'll wait till next time to actually solve those two possible triangles. But to answer the question that was put here, we would just say that is two triangles and call it a day. All right, I hope that made sense. As always, if it didn't, come by office hours. Here are several for you to try. You know the drill. Pause the video, please, and... Give it a shot. All right, I'm going to assume you've done your duty here. And let me reveal the first two solutions. Those are the first two solutions. And I've highlighted the quantities that you need to be uh, comparing. Um, and in the first case, there's zero triangles. Second one, there's one triangle. If you didn't get that, I'd, I'd ask that you go back and, and check and see if you can figure it out and try C and D again. But if those two are good, let's go on to C and D. Okay, and there are C and D. Two triangles and one triangle, respectively. Um, hope that made sense. Come on by, if not.